All right, I'm going to get started. Welcome. I'm so excited to see you here. The neuroscience of change has been really top of mind for me this year, and I found myself doing a deep dive into this from my own intellectual curiosity. So I'm really excited to get to share it with you today um, and hear what you have to think about it. So some of you know a little bit about my background. I've been consulting in the leadership and organization space for 25 years. My doctorate is in education, leadership, and organizations. So I really look at the intersection of leadership and learning. And how do we bring out the best in our orgs? We bring out the best in our people. So I think we've all seen the statistic, and it actually ranges from 70 to 85%. If you think about the billions of dollars spent on change initiatives that fail, and that's probably monthly, right? I mean, it's just staggering. And I know a bunch of us are trying to crack this nut. Like, how do we make go through change effectively? How do we manage it effectively? So I wanted to give us some tools for thinking about change. And the reality is that change at work today is super fast-paced, right? Technology ensures that, right? They change the iPhone every 36 days, it seems like. Um, and software changing constantly. It's constantly coming at us, and it's coming at us in multiple channels. So it's not like we're managing one change initiative that we had plenty of time to get ready for. We could be managing hundreds of change initiatives at the same time. Now, what does change look like in an organization? It could look like you get a new job, you're part of a new team, you have a different role. You could get a new manager. Some people could be added to your team. You could get a new leader. You could roll out a new technology or a process or a procedure. Maybe your company decides to expand with a new product or service. Perhaps you move into a new market or territory or you go after a different type of customer. Perhaps you're global. Right? You should be. We all are pretty much these days. You're operating in a new country or a new cultural context. And you might even have a whole new company, a whole new future laid out in front of you. And all of those work changes can drive big personal changes. You may be moving into a new home, moving your kids to a new school, starting in a new community. Not all change is created equal. So I was trying to wrap my brain around, how do we make sense of this? We can't treat all change the same. So is there a way for us to start thinking about change? And I, I started to realize that you know, time to acclimation is part of it. How long does it take for someone to get used to the change? How much disruption does that change prevent, present in that person's life? What are the total number of changes they're managing? And how fast are they coming? Right? This is the total change picture that we're really thinking about. So I've kind of articulated this change matrix where we think about change, time to acclimation across the bottom and amount of disruption up the top. And things that are low and low, we might put in the green zone, for example. But if something was high time to acclimation, low amount of disruption, might be kind of orange for you. It just depends on what it is. Or if it's high disruption, low acclimation, it might be orange. And then if it's high and high, it's probably in the red zone. What this has influenced, though, is choice and desire. If it's, a if it's a change you choose, you have a totally different psychological relationship to it than one that's put on you. And if it's a choice you want, same thing, right, versus an unwanted change. So we have to factor those in. So I'm just going to throw some things up here, some things that happen in companies every day. And this is random. You would place these for yourself, but I'm just going to give us some examples. So something that might be low is the faucet that's in the bathroom right? <laughs> they change the faucet, whatever. You don't even really notice it. You move on. Maybe it takes you a day, right? But maybe you change, you know, you have a new workspace. They change your desk. Maybe meals change at work. I know we get really attached to our food. Um, change email. That's fun. Going from Outlook to Google or vice versa. Um, changing a policy might not be a big deal. If it's submitting travel receipts, hello, all of us who are here traveling, um, and that becomes a lot more detailed, a lot of, you know, it could be a lot of adjustment to that. Certainly software, we know that oftentimes it provides a lot of challenge, right? It could be chosen by the organization, but most employees find it very annoying to change software on them. And then certainly if you have your move to a new location, if you're put on a new team, if you have a new boss, right? So I randomly put these up there based on maybe where I would place them. The thing is it's personal. So where I place them and where another person places them are completely different. So I also realized we need to start thinking about change load, which is how much total change someone is carrying at a period of time. It's not like change comes along in these nice little individual buckets that we get to check off the list before another one comes. They start overlapping. 
And when two oranges overlap, it becomes a darker orange. And if you put that on top of a green, it starts to look red. And then you add a red on top of that, and pretty soon, you got a lot going on. So I want to give you a minute to just try this on. So get in pairs or triads. Um, if you want to do this on your own, you can as well. But I, you know I'm a big believer in interaction. It's part of processing in the brain. Um, but I want to give you five minutes to just try this on. Think about your last year. What kind of changes have you gone through? Right? And where would you place them on the map? So grab a pen and actually place them on the map based on you. And as you add them in, start to think about your change load. What did it look like? So five minutes on the clock.
Um, so I got a quick question during the break. So the change load is just kind of for you to map, map, did they start stacking on top of each other? If all your change was spread out over several months, you might not have gotten very high up the load. If you had a lot at one time, you might have been hitting kind of your bandwidth. It's kind of your change bandwidth is a way to think about it. So what can we do to make it better, right? I want to leave you with some good strategies. So first of all, we can't ignore the brain. We got to work with the brain, right? It's going to need information to make those mental and, and relational maps. It's going to need information to deal with the natural anxiety. It's going to need help with the habits. Fourth thing we can do is measure change fatigue. So as much as we can look at how we ourselves are managing change with that little grid I gave you, is someone in the organization tracking that? Most of us are not, right? We're rolling out changes and we're not necessarily noticed, gosh, the marketing team is on their fourth leader. Or gosh, they're on their fourth leader, we change their desks and we change their software. Maybe they should be the last folks to get the new copier, not the first, right? So we can be thoughtful. If we start to kind of map who's getting how much change, we can just make more thoughtful decisions. And when you're a small company, that's easier to track. As you get bigger, you're going to have to use your data analytics to do it. But most of the software systems we're using to track talent and pay and change of manager and change of location, we can pull data metrics. It should be somebody's job to man monitor that and be tracking net change. So things to think about, how fast is that pace coming for a team and are they getting time to cover in between? You know, what has this person or this team gained or lost? If you know the marketing team just lost a beloved leader, like everyone was thriving under this person, it's going to be much more time of disruption and much more time of acclimation than if, you know, it was a good, a good exit, right? They, they, they're happy to see the person go. So those are things to think about. So I think we should be mapping the change matrix and change load and thinking about it for our teams. What are they going through? And certainly our learning events should be designing the habits. So the habits are really what are the behaviors you need them doing in the new job? If you're having them change software, then the learning should have them use the software in the room, not just talk about the software. If you're bringing leaders together to learn how to lead change, they should practice it in the room, not back at their desks. And then finally, neuroscience of learning, I'm not going to go into this, but the, the structure that's involved with learning is the hippocampus, and it can take in data for about 20 minutes before it needs to process. So your learning events should never go have a talking for more than 15 minutes before you have them do a processing activity because the brain literally can't hold more than 20 minutes of information without losing some of it. So that's why I've built in every, every 15 minutes you're having a, a dyad discussion. We're doing mini processing so it gets pushed into your short-term memory and then your hippocampus is ready to take in more information. I talk more about that in my book, Wired to Grow, and also in the lynda.com neuroscience of learning. So if you want that information, you can get that. So this is one of my favorite quotes. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the others find themselves equipped to a deal with a world that no longer exists. So the other thing we want to do is create a learning culture in our organization, right? Turn on those lifelong learners, because if they see learning as the way that they can move through change and be ready for anything that's coming at them, they'll also be partners with us on this journey. Well, thank you so much for your time and energy. I really appreciate it.